Are you suffering from mental illness? If yes, blame society. And this video documentary series will give you plenty of reasons to blame absolutely every problem in your life on today's world. From mega corporations to the dissolution of the nuclear family unit, what are the major problems with the world we live in today? Let's dive. The first major issue with Western society today is the atomization and isolation of young people. With the rise of social media and mass consumerism, it's caused a sharp increase in mental illness and depression, and it's no wonder why. Every day, we are constantly bombarded by adverts and products placements, intended to make us mindless consumeristic robots. With social media pulling wool over our eyes and feeding us a fabricated world, one to keep us sedated and discontent, but too weak and complacent to stand up and fight back. So are we really surprised that the prevalence of mental health conditions are rising by more than 10% per year? With sites like Instagram promoting a fabricated lifestyle, apps like Snapchat using our innate human functions against us, making us desire virtual goals and friendships, it's no wonder why depression and suicide is on the rise. But it's not just social media. The rise of incessant consumeristic lifestyles, often ones filled with hedonism, materialism, and greed. Relationships with other people have become less and less valuable as time goes on in our society. The very relationships that are said to last a lifetime, that our grandparents so cherished, are being substituted for luxury handbags and clothes, all in an attempt to fill the gaping hole that was created in the first place. This consumerism doesn't exist for the sake of existing, but it also serves two primary purposes. One, it seeks to maximize profits. We have been farmed for our attention. Our minds have become a war zone, not of conflicting ideas or beliefs, but of conflicting companies, brands, and products. Which coat should I buy? And which purse should I get? It's all the same. Two, it's to isolate and weaken the populace. If dystopia were to come within the next 15 years, it will not come in the form of thought crime and censorship, but of a highly consumeristic, sedated, and distracted populace that is easily manipulated by conglomerations of massive corporations. A dystopia of free markets for the ultra-wealthy, but a socialist rule for everyone else. A world where real free markets cease to exist and are replaced by an infinite money funnel to line the pockets of the 1%. A modern-day feudalism, where the average man lacks all political freedom, civil liberties, and economic independence, whereas the rich get to operate however they please. A return to a commu feudalistic society. This hybrid of two extremely dysfunctional systems has never been seen by history yet, and I hope it will stay that way. Under this rule, an extremely cynical population would arise, as loneliness would become the status quo. This is slowly creeping into our society, even by today, and is rearing its ugly head, preparing to destroy us all. Through this isolation, through this loneliness, we grasp at anything that remotely resembles genuine human connection, and we grasp for anything, really. So, what do these parasocial relationships look like? Well, things only get darker from here. Influencer culture. An issue that stemmed from the rise of television in Hollywood, only amplified by the rise of the internet. With platforms like Twitch and YouTube, as well as the previously mentioned Instagram and Snapchat, we are focused on the lives of people that we have never and will never meet more than ever before in history. In the extreme case, we see people take advantage of this, with the site OnlyFans preying on the sharp increase of loneliness, especially in men. All this just perpetuates the hedonistic and materialistic lifestyle I mentioned earlier. What are the implications of this? 1. This puts many people into a state of investment in others' lives. Like mentioned before, this creates many parasocial relationships that are not natural, and this is hastened rapidly. 2. This devalues fame to an incredible degree. During most of history, fame was an extremely difficult thing to acquire, either requiring a great deal of talent or brilliance. With only the most influential figures like the king and innovators of science, writing, and art known by many. Nowadays, the opposite seems to be true. 
with everyone seemingly gaining their 15 seconds of fame, and not many can keep it. The ones who do have a few different trajectories. 1. Be known for the single viral moment and have their life's worth tied to 15 seconds worth of footage. 2. Cash out. Whether that be promoting scammy crypto startups, taking every sponsor under the moon, or creating OnlyFans, it seems to be the best way out for most people. Finally, the extreme minority, cases where this person does develop fame, is usually one of two types. One, a parasocial type described before, or someone known for simply being famous, or fame for fame's sake. This worthless fame is also a contributing factor to the influence of mental massacre of the postmodern era, with some people able to name all the Kardashians, but not the four seasons and the year when the US was founded. This was in Times Square to be clear. This really underlines the key problem with all the nuances. This is all a distraction. A distraction for genuine human interaction. A distraction from the world itself, its bleakness and desolation. A distraction from our history, as those who forget history are doomed to repeat it, and those who do are cursed to watch it again. This is the issue that we keep returning to, this distractions everywhere you go. You're bombarded by these ads, by the culture, by the influences you don't want to be influenced by. But there's been a significant group being targeted relentlessly by this. Men. At first, many may be confused by what I mean here. Let me explain. There's been a rise in two primary categories of content, incel slash blackpilled and alpha male podcasts. Some smaller but significant genres include self-help and an increase in the fitness genre. All these have a similarity and they stem from a general dissatisfaction about the way life is for many of these young men. As third wave feminism has gained so much notoriety, it has also villainized men as an oppressor and this has left many men feeling unrepresented. Feminism is an issue with many nuances, but in simplest terms, it can be described as three separate waves. The first wave was during the suffrage movement in the 1910s, where women fought for the right to have equal representation. The second wave was a campaign in the 1940s and 50s for women to enter the workplace to an equal degree of success. Third wave feminism is more difficult to pinpoint the start and end for one reason. It lacks a fundamental goal. Unlike the past two movements, which had one distinct goal, Third Wave attempted to address many issues at once, some with no actual evidence of existing. There are two possible places where the beginning of Third Wave could be distinguished. One, the 1960s and the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution was a series of events that occurred during the 1960s along with the civil rights movement. It consisted of a few things, for example the legalization of prostitution, abortion, and the promotion of promiscuity being some key issues. It seeked to liberate women from the bounds of marriage and promote a more liberal view of sex. Many trace third wave feminism back to this point and it's where I personally would as well. My reasoning is as follows. History can be measured in swings about 60 years consisting of this cycle. First, counterculture rises against the current culture then it gains popularity with the new generations until it becomes mainstream. Then, as time passes, newer generations begin to dislike the mainstream culture and counterculture takes place again. This is called the pendulum effect. To put this into perspective, the 1960s is the start of the liberalization counterculture. It was against the highly patriotic, militaristic, and nationalistic ideals of the past 60 years where both world wars occurred. This nationalism, especially Nazism and fascism, as a whole can be traced to another counterculture, one against the liberalization of the West with strides in democratization and abolition. In other areas like societal structure, the same can be said. From the 1770s, a period of disarray would occur, ending with the defeat of Napoleon in the late 1810s. Then a period of stability would occur, only broken by the Franco-Prussian War and followed by the World Wars. After the defeat of Nazi Germany, we see yet another period of stability with war not prevalent in Western society. A clarification, these cultures are not referring to pop culture or what's popular or fashionable, but schools of thought, ideologies, and belief systems and the popularity of these systems and ideologies. If we take the 1960s as a point of reference, we can accurately understand the cycle, and if the theory is correct, it doesn't make sense for the next theory to be true. 
The second belief is that third wave feminism began in 2016. This is drastically different from the first theory and hinges on a different point. Rather than focusing on the liberalization efforts of third wave, they focus on the goallessness of third wave instead. If anyone was online during 2016, it was an incredibly chaotic year, with Donald Trump entering the political scenes with many scandals, many believed he was the one who prompted third wave. Coupled with the social justice movement, this idea of third wave is what caused many of the issues we see today, with it focusing on irrelevant issues like manspreading coupled with the vilification of all men has caused many of the results we will discuss. My opinion is that third wave originally started in the 60s and continues today adopting parts with social justice. The vilification of men as before has led to a rise in a few countercultures but only one will become mainstream. This ultimately leads to four outcomes at the moment, incel, alpha male, far right, and actual improvement. Incel is short for involuntary celibate, and it represents a group of men who want but are unable to have romantic or sexual relationships. Many of them blame women for their problems and often develop extreme misogyny. Others choose to adopt the black pill, a continuation of the blue pill, red pill culture of dating and relationships in the postmodern. Black pill is the belief that your success in romantic relationships is determined solely by your looks and it's down to your genetics and nothing you can do is able to change that. It is an extremely pessimistic view and the ideology itself does more harm to these people than their problems. These terms of pills are used most frequently in relation to dating but has some connotation outside of the fi this field. In broader terms, the pills are used to view society as a whole relying each pill on worldview. The blue pill being the sedated status quo, the consumeristic lifestyle we observed previously, the red pill being the escape, mental and physical, and releasing yourself from the status quo, and the black pill is the opposite. Its ideals can be described as highly nihilistic with the belief that no action we can do is able to change the course of society and that the trajectory is towards the incinerator. This belief of you shouldn't try because it's all going down the drain anyway mentality is what causes most of these people's problems. Many of the followers of this ideology aren't looking for a way to improve, but a reason to cope and use an excuse. The second group of content is alpha male podcasts. This type of content has been prevalent for a while, but has seen a sharp and explosive rise since one name came to notoriety. Emery Andrew Tate coined top g by his followers his rise has been marked by controversy and conflict from his extremely unpopular views on societal issues to his controversial past tate has divided many right-wing spaces on the internet on one hand many praise him for his attack of the matrix calling a deadly strike against the woke social justice mainstream he was a symbol of the counterculture a rallying point for dissatisfied young men and boys on the other hand, many more traditional conservatives disliked him as much as the left with his promotion of materialism and polyamory. Many believed his ideas were similar to the status quo, still being a message of hedonism and consumerism. Others, like the influential Michael Knowles, has taken a modern stance. He agrees with many issues Tate has outlined in modern society, as we are here, but disagrees with the solutions, which include getting filthy rich and buying fancy vehicles. Whether you like him or not, it's impossible to not acknowledge the effect Tate has had on the internet. Many young men have rallied to him, praising him as a savior and hero. Although many regard Tate as a misogynistic figure, I personally find him to be moderate compared to some of his counterparts. With his immense popularity, many saw this as an opportunity to gain fame. The most notable of these is the ex-YouTuber Sneeko. Once well-known and respected for his introspective and thought-provoking videos, his long journey on YouTube ended abruptly after a few months of live streaming where he would react to videos and content. It was during these few months where his integrity was destroyed as he tried to become a Tate clone. Much of the advice given by the alpha male gurus is extremely poor and also does not improve the lives of the viewers. Many other men would choose to join a political organization where they can meet like-minded individuals, but not just any political organization, but the far right. This isn't the Jordan Peterson left-wing definition of far right, but genuine neo-Nazism. 
The problem with modern day is that these words have lost all meaning as the far left has used them to slander their enemies, which allows the real evils to be disregarded. When once the gravest accusations are used as degrading insults towards your political enemies, such words lose their meaning. However, in this case, many of these people are not simply political enemies of the mainstream left, but people who have been swindled by an evil ideology. Many believe in white supremacy and hold anti-Semitic sentiments. Others are for eugenics and ethnic cleansing. Whatever their ideology might be, this does nothing but worsen their problems. The final category is the best option out of the ones we've seen so far. Whether it be physical or mental improvement, improvement channels have sprung up everywhere, along with a spike in the fitness genre. This comes in an era where body positivity has warped our perception of health and fitness. What was once a movement to support veterans who've suffered injuries and people with disabilities has become a platform to support obesity and sloth. This is by no means an attack against fat people as I believe no one should be made fun of for their weight, but there have been many studies showing that obesity causes significant health problems. So we should be encouraging people to lose weight because it's literally saving their life. The fitness genre has seen perpetual growth over the past few years and it's a trend that is healthy. On the other hand, we have mental improvement. Similar to Alpha Male Podcast, many individuals seek to assist young men in bettering themselves. The difference is that these people are significantly more successful. Their advice is more orthodox, yet more powerful. Instead of conveying a materialistic worldview like Tate and Sneeko, they focus more on the spiritual and intellectual. Tate is well known for disliking intellectuals, or as he calls them, bookworms. Many support reading and studying, something Tate believes won't get you ahead. Most notable out of this category is Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson. Many describe Peterson as far right, but as we previously mentioned, it's because he opposes many policy and stances on the current left-wing mainstream. He is, by definition, center-right. Whether or not you agree with his political stance or not, it is important to acknowledge that he has given many pieces of good advice which include a vocal support for public discourse and meeting ideas not similar to your own. He also promotes reading, a necessity that is lacking in today's world. Although many significant figures exist, he is the most influential in this category. The reason I chose to devote a portion of this video to talk about the struggle of weak men can be seen in history. Whenever the male population of an empire becomes complacent, the empire ultimately falls. Whether it be Rome or China, whenever the men of the nation are weak and complacent, its opponents win. Just take a look at modern China, when boys are told to be loyal and subservient to the Communist Party, working their mental and physical abilities. Then look at America, where a massive fraction of the populace is overweight and don't care for studying. It's no wonder that as soon as a tool like ChatGPT was released, we thought of it not as a tool to aid in education, but as a method of cheating and fraud at our own expense. So is our golden age over? Is the fall of Western society inevitable? Well. Not exactly. What we might see is a significant shift in social and political order. Why? The pendulum effect. With the increasing popularity of far-right ideology, coupled with the alienation of a significant portion of the voter base by the mainstream left as it drifts towards the extreme, followed by the end of the 60-year time period we see throughout history, it is extremely likely that a dramatic shift in mainstream culture is inevitable two main products would arise. One, the return of religiosity to a certain degree. As secularism is promoted heavily, we may see the opposite of this arise. The return of Christianity to Western society is highly probable, with more mainstream right-wing figures adopting a more positive view on Christianity. Two, the return of some form of social conservatism. With increasingly liberal policies being pushed, we may see a rise in conservatism, with organizations like Young America's Foundation, Turning Point USA, and The Daily Wire becoming progressively more mainstream, along with many statistics showing young men are increasingly conservative. Conservatism will be the mainstream ideology for the next few decades. This is why we see an increasingly authoritarian version of the left that is arising. They are desperately trying to stop the pendulum from swinging back, as it would hit them in the face. I won't go into detail regarding any global organizations or governmental bodies here, as they will require significant time for themselves, but to summarize, some notable organizations have been promoting a form of socialist feudalism like mentioned before, most notably the World Economic Forum. As the average citizen is told to give up their cars, travel, and meat to stop the climate crisis, 
the top billionaires and World Economic Forum board members still fly in private jets and have private chauffeurs. Ultimately, it's about control and the desire to destroy the pendulum effect as not many has successfully avoided its wrath. In conclusion, we see many issues that have arisen from a complacent, distracted, and hedonistic populace. With growing rates of obesity and the lack of desire to learn, it seems our society is falling apart. But there is hope. In states of chaos, order is restored. <laughs> the pendulum effect has been keeping both sides from establishing complete control over the culture and ensuring the survival of ever-changing and shifting countercultures. While the times we live in may seem dire, it may become a footnote in the annals of history in due time.